Good evening and welcome to our session of today with Associate Professor Elise Vadreau. Um, she is an Associate Professor for International Relations and the Environment at the Department of Political Science of the University of Vienna. Um, Elise is a visiting research fellow at the Center for Science and Policy of the University of Cambridge. And since 2018, a principal investigator for the ERC project Maripol Data here at the University of Vienna. Um, in her research, she focuses on the role of knowledge and science in international environmental politics and within the context of global environmental negotiations and agreement making. And this is also what she will tell us about in today's presentation. Um, and um, amongst a lot of other things, she focuses on conflict and power struggles over knowledge and science in these uh, environmental negotiation sites and has introduced um, the concept of epistemic selectivities to study um, these um, struggles and study communities of knowledge holders um, and in their involvement in these in this this type of politics. And she has um, conducted fieldwork at more than 15 different environmental uh, multilateral negotiation sites over the past years. Uh, so today's presentation will take us to the level of global politics and focus particularly on how democracy is practiced in digital environmental negotiation sites. Um, and uh, Alice's presentation draws substantially on her own research and on papers that have uh, been published recently. And uh, without further ado, I will hand the floor over to Alice. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. So uh, Paul is um, a PhD student also associated with my research project, Marie Paul, Paul Data, and I'm honored that you introduced me here because it's um, lovely to work with you. So um, today I will talk about participation and inclusiveness at digital environmental negotiation sites. And um, as Paul just introduced, my research so far um, was always interested in understanding struggle related to the distribution of knowledge in international negotiations. So how does the digital come in, into this? And so today I will not only talk about my research, but also how I had to, together with my team, adjust to new research circumstances introduced by COVID-19, forcing governments, but also forcing those that study government relations in these settings into digital sites. And so the question that I will ask right at the beginning is, what happens when negotiations move online and what are potential effects on participation and inclusiveness? So what are impacts on, on democracy, on the quality of democracy um, in these multilateral negotiation sites when they have to move online? So to give you an idea of what we talk about, so these are the sites of multilateral environmental diplomacy. These are negotiation rooms. The example that I chose here, it's COP14 of the Convention on Biological Diversity that took place in 2018 uh, in Sharm el-Sheikh. So just now you have the COP15, taking place in, in Montreal, in, in Canada. So these so-called conferences of the parties gather many people during a specific period of time together to negotiate treaty text. But it's not just the negotiations that matter when we talk about the sites. It's also the informal and the formal spaces where protests can take place. So it's what's happening inside very small informal gatherings where states negotiate treaty texts, especially when they have difficult conflicts that they need to resolve. But it's also outside of the negotiation room and the negotiation venue, it's on the streets, where in parallel to negotiations, as you can see here, Fridays for Future movements protest on the street for more ambitious goals. So in the past years, the sites of multilateral environmental diplomacy had to go online. And in order to understand what was happening, as you can see here, this is a picture on the left side where you see the former president, um, Bolsonaro, Brazilian president, who joined 
the United Nations General Assembly online. On the right side, you also see this is a hybrid form of negotiations. The seats are empty, but the chairs are sitting and co having conversations with people online. So these types of multilateral negotiations that we understand as digital multilateralism, they emerged in the past years, especially due to COVID. And this will be um, one of the main uh, things that we will be looking into um, this lecture. So the starting point is the understanding of negotiation sites as important entry points to study contemporary dynamics in global environmental politics. Um, and these sites aren't so far relevant when we talk about democracy because they are considered to be sites of political action, of contestation and of order making. And they have been coined as sites um, and entry points for radical democracy, which I will present later in the lecture. So during these negotiations, diverse actors come together for a predefined period of time into a really meticulously orchestrated venue that is structured by diplomatic practice, protocols and procedures. And during these negotiations, actors, they seek to influence the global response to environmental degradation. But we can observe that as researchers, um, our power struggles are how actors seek to influence, but we can also observe new forms of power and influence. And one of the key questions when we talk about digital multilateralism is how will digital negotiations or new hybrid forms of negotiating global environmental agreements shape power struggles or shape the possibility to influence the outcome of global environmental meetings? For me as a researcher, but also for my, my team, uh, including uh, Paul, these are sites that offer the opportunity for observation, analysis, and critique of global environmental action, and they include many different issues. So I already mentioned biodiversity and climate change, but there are also new negotiations that started a few weeks ago on plastic pollution in the ocean. So global environmental meetings, they cover a broad range of issues. Um, and depending on, on the different issue, the size varies, the actors vary, but in general, these multilateral negotiations look always pretty similar. So there are two key questions that I would like to ask today. One is what happens when multilateral negotiations go online? And I say are forced to go online because the extent to which COVID-19 has really shaped this development is really significant. And the second question is, what does this imply for participation and inclusiveness of different actors into these negotiations? And as, as a consequence of this also, how does this also shape and influence the exercise of, of power in the end? The second starting point of this lecture, and that's something I, I, I think you already um, yeah, understood from what I said earlier, is my own research. So I have followed international negotiations now for more than 10 years. Um, and I analyzed different negotiation sites. And the key objective of my ongoing project is to find a more systematic approach to study these sites collectively. So these are a few publications um, that I will also um, present today in relation to what we did when we had to follow the negotiations online. Um, and these are just some impressions. So on the right uh, side, you see it, my PhD student, Anne Langlet. So we were doing uh, digital ethnography together during online meetings. So um, we had to find new ways to actually study these sites and understand um, the effect on, on democracy as well. So the structure of the lecture, I will first like to, I would first like to give you um, some background information on why these sites of environmental diplomacy actually matter and how do they work. Um, I suppose this is a very diverse uh, group of students. Some might know my work uh, and might be familiar with multilateral environmental diplomacy, others might not. So I think it's really important um, that you understand why are these sites so important, especially if we want to understand trends in diplomacy and um, democracy and how they are shaped by um, digital practices. In the second part, uh, I would like to introduce the term digital multilateralism. That's a term that I developed together with my PhD student, Silvia Ruiz Rodriguez, um, who is at the moment attending CBD COP15 in Montreal. So um, 
also with the question in mind on what digital practices actually, how they appear at the site themselves. In the third part, we will dive deeper into um, the notion of participation and inclusiveness. Um, so we conducted a survey as part of um, the project Maripol Data together with my research team, um, trying to understand how actors perceive the effects of these digital sites. And um, then in the last part, I will just problematize a few developments that are associated um, with online futures of international negotiations. So why do the sites of environmental diplomacy matter and how do they work? So um, the value of multilateral environmental negotiations and summits um, is especially linked to the fact that it's considered to be universal. So universal multilateralism implying that all member states of the United Nations and non-state actors can take part in these events. This, of course, is not true for summits such as the G8 or the G20, but in principle, the sites that I'm interested in, the sites of global environmental agreement making, are characterized by universal multilateralism. Um, the second aspect that is very important is that participation has always been key. So a universal participation, but also of states, but also the possibility of several non-state actors to take part in an endeavor that gathers diplomacy at the highest political level. So the pictures that you see here show, you see um, Obama that was um, at COP15 of the climate negotiations. Um, and below you see Angela Merkel and um, uh, Sarkozy, the former French president. So they gather at these sites, especially in the second week of these negotiations. So this is why it's often considered to be the highest political level. Although we have to say in the last negotiations, we have not seen head of states attending these meetings. So that's also something that is constantly changing and uh, telling a lot about the value that states attribute to these events. So instead, for instance, they would send um, ministers of the environment. There is also some kind of urgency and the political level associated with these big events, these summit. Um, and it has also been studied in terms of as a, as a break uh, through of a diplomatic impasse. So always these negotiations start and states do not seem to agree at all. There is a lot of conflict. There is a lot of uh, drama involved in these events. And in the end, states managed to find a solution. So this is also why um, you have work um, that sees these negotiations as drama or theater. I will refer to this a bit later. And um, so as I said, at the final stage of the negotiations, you have often head of state that are involved, as you see here on these two pictures. Um, this, these are sites. Why are they so important? They are important because they are sites where um, multilateral environmental agreements, so-called MEAs, are negotiated and where in consequence legal order is made. So you see on the right side, this is a screenshot from um, uh, a, a, a text that I've been following, so I've been following its making, and you states basically attend this meeting to negotiate text, to negotiate words, the order of words, and the kind of specific terms, numbers, and figures that they would like to see in these documents. So they negotiate language of new treaties, um, and they also review and advance the implementation of MEAs by further developing text at periodic meetings. So I don't know who is following the negotiations in, um, in this, on the CBD, but there, for instance, they are negotiating the global biodiversity framework. So the text already exists of the Convention on Biological Diversity, but now, um, 30 years after its um, adoption, states negotiate new targets, new goals, and how they can actually reach them. So multilateral environmental agreements focus on environmental issues. They create binding international law, and they include multiple countries. Um, they also can adapt uh, to changing circumstances. So for instance, you can have negotiations of decisions or amendment to adjust multilateral environmental agreement, as I just mentioned, with the global biodiversity framework. And you also have often instances where new independent agreements are negotiated. So for instance, the Kyoto Protocol 
is a protocol under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So it's a form of adjustment of the UN C. The key principles of multilateralism have been um, discussed in scholarship as um, different from bilateral negotiations. So several scholars have tried to define what these negotiations are about, and they defined them as a process of simultaneous negotiation by three or more parties over one or more issues that aims at an agreement acceptable to all participants. So um, scholarship has defined um, specific criteria. So for instance, you have multiple parties involved, multiple issues addressed, um, participants have multiple roles, and there are different, different um, types of participants also in these meetings. And they are also, uh, they have the characteristic of an ongoing nature, different physical spaces. It's difficult to determine and evaluate the outcomes of such meetings. Um, and many of them, or most of them, have consensus as a decision-making rule, um, which can make the process also quite difficult. Um, these meetings, they are orchestrated. This is really important because it turned out to be extremely difficult to orchestrate these meetings when they turn digital. But what do, do I mean by orchestration? So the complexity of these meetings, um, they have pushed diplomats to develop multilateral practices that are different from bilateral negotiations, but they have also forced them to establish rules that make it possible to actually negotiate with multiple parties. Um, and this is so difficult because it's a simultaneous process. It involves, as I said, multiple parties and an orchestrator. So in normally you have presidents that are elected, chairs and facilitators that are also elected representing different regions. So you will often find chairs and facilitators from the African region or um, uh, the, the north, um, north, um, the northern hemisphere, so representing the US, Europe, um, or Latin American um, states. So you have elected chairs that orchestrate these meetings together with facilitators from the treaty secretariat and other stuff from the United Nations, including translation services and transcript writers. So I'm mentioning this here because you need a whole set uh, of supporting practices and supporting roles to allow uh, representatives of state to actually engage in these treaty negotiations. And something that makes these negotiations so complex and difficult is that decision making is often based on consensus. So uh, on the right side, you see the president of the so-called BBNJ negotiations that I'm currently observing on uh, a, a new treaty to protect the high seas. So he, she has the little wooden hammer. And this means every time that consensus is reached, she will push this little hammer to uh, illustrate that there are no um, critical voices anymore and that nobody has anything uh, to say on a specific part of the treaty. So the attainment of consensus as a decision-making rule um, means that there is uh, no abstention or that abstention is an affirmative rather than a negative vote. So you will often have states that are not very happy with the text, but they will not say anything. So they do not have to actively want something or to say, yes, I agree with, but they rather abstain from critique or um, from wanting to change anything else in the treaty. So the reaching of a compromise um, means that the compromise needs to be reasonably acceptable to all. Um, so if, for instance, you have Fiji or another very small state that does not um, agree to the text, then basically there will be no agreement. Um, so in order to attract consensus, this means that um, it, the text needs to be expressed constructively and often include ambiguous terms that are not very clear. And this is extremely important to avoid that states will be against something. So um, in the, I, I will again refer to the biodiversity negotiations. States currently negotiate uh, in the global biodiversity framework and target three says 
a specific percentage of areas should be protected by protected areas. And states negotiate the percentage. And some states say 30%, but there are also states that say, maybe we do not agree on a specific percentage because then it's easier for everybody to agree on the text. So that's why many agreements and many treaties use ra rather ambiguous terms uh, and try to refrain from being very precise on what states are obliged to implement at the national level, because you will always find states that do not agree. A veto rarely exists in these multilateral negotiations. So you do have parties that disagree with the proposed treaty or a section thereof, but they can abstain without blocking the whole outcome. Yeah? Still, there is a certain pressure to accept consensus language, and this is often so high that parties um, may agree to the text very late, so they negotiate the whole night, um, just not to be blamed for the failure of the negotiations. Um, so one effect of this is that you often have treaties with the lowest common denominator, so-called agreement without T's, also without T's because you often have no sanctions. Um, and what is important is that there are international sociopolitical pressures rather than legal obligations to conform. Yeah? This is also something that justifies uh, the analysis of these sites as uh, sites um, of, of drama and theater and sites where, like a stage, where in general states try to perform and to be um, seen as, as high performers also in the environmental respect. Very common to these negotiations is that there are uh, many um, informal rooms where states negotiate um, in small groups or bilaterally, so negotiations behind closed door. These are examples from um, the Climate Change Convention, COP15 in 2009 in Copenhagen. So it's actually quite a historical moment that is captured here on the, on the right side with many states, including the US, sitting together and trying to frame or to formulate an alternative treaty. And on the left side, you see the German Chancellor Angela Merkel in a bilateral talk with um, former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd. Um, now I would like to point to something that I mentioned a few times, this notion of the stage or the drama and the theater. And these ideas, they come from post-structuralist um, theories and perspectives on summits and diplomacy. And um, these, this scholarship argues that summits or multilateral negotiations, but especially summits because they are considered to take place at this high level with a lot of media attention, that they are no, not neutral spaces or technical institutions designed to facilitate cooperation between pre-existing parties, but instead these sites um, have to be analyzed regarding their performative dimension. So from this um, angle, from this analytical angle, diplomacy is perceived as an intersubjective and constitutive endeavor or practice in the sense that the diplomatic process takes place between two constructed subjects whose very construction relies on the intercourse and mutual recognition of diplomacy. So meaning if you have two states um, negotiating with each other in this setting, then these states, they become subject um, by relating to the other state. The same is true with non-state actors as well. Um, what scholars following this perspective argue is that there is no distinction between real politics and illu illu illusionary ritual. So the ritual, the spectacle, the performance, they are all real in these settings because they create real political effects and all real politics, they involve a degree of performance, identity construction, and play acting. Um, and this is why Carl Des, for instance, argues that summits have stages, scripts, casts, uh, and audiences. And the audiences are extremely important. Um, if you think of media, media, for instance, has a very important role during these negotiations. There are press conferences. Um, so you often hear this term, especially from NGOs, uh, and especially set to so-called, you know, blocking states. You know, everybody's watching us. We have to find an agreement. 
So you have an audience that goes beyond the few journalists in the room, but that include the globe and the specific pressure put on states to agree on text. And so these fictions and dramas of diplomacy, they never end. They become the world of diplomacy and they are what there is. That was what Constantino already said in the 90s. Um, it, but it's so important to consider this because it implies that these negotiations are political in a very fundamental sense. They exist and constitute, brings to life and makes real the identities and subjectivity of the parties who participate in them. And this is um, what was also interpreted as a form of show politics. So an integral part of the politics of simulation by means of which late modern society manages to sustain at least for the time being what is known to be unsustainable and show politics in the sense that there is a political class that demonstrate that they can offer alternative visions um, that electorates are still making a choice between these visions and that political institutions are still capable of then implementing their decisions. So just to describe this in different words. So the idea is that this drama involved that often shows state cannot do it, they cannot agree, they will not be able to save our planet. It's part of this drama and theater. And in the end, they can do it, they can make it. And this is what Blüdorn means by show politics. So a specific strategic um, effect that these negotiations have to demonstrate, okay, it's, it's good, our governments are doing their job. Yeah, so it's part of this, of this theater. Um, still, there are limitations of assuming that our elected leaders are in charge and can in a few days of negotiations with other leaders at the summit solve the issue. So in the end, this is always portrayed not as a problem of political will, but as contemporary power relations that are much more dispersed um, and hybrid. Um, and this is why the term radical democracy emerged. So diplomacy and summits considered as spaces of radical diplomacy, uh, the democracy, I'm sorry. So such spaces can be incredibly valuable to social movements, for instance, activists and protesters seeking visible innovative forms of action who have been able to hijack mega events to stage their own festival of residence. So there is a lot of literature that looked especially into this. So how this is not just, these are not just sites for states to interact and agree, but also sites where different visions uh, can, can be created and can also be um, represented. So um, the term counter summit, for instance, was developed to actually show this. Um, and to argue that these summits offer windows for visibility of alternative voices. Um, and this is interpreted indeed as a reinvention of democracy. And here I would like to just to read this quote. So a reinvention of society such that the mode of economic production, the structures of political governance, the dissemination of scientific innovation, the organization of the media, social relations and the relationships between society and nature are subjected to a radical participatory and living democratic process. And this observation is in so far important and relevant because in fact, um, it's only governments that are represented, represented in these settings. So you will not find, for instance, um, political parties that are uh, uh, also part of, you know, of a national government being in the opposition you do not have this kind of uh, checks and balances at the multilateral level. However, you do have this form of radical diplomacy on the one side and on the other side, I would like to mention this here as well. You do have something that is called an interparliamentarian union, gathering representatives of political parties, including of course, uh, representatives of the opposition to take part in this setting, to meet, to discuss how to move on with certain issues. And on the other side, you often have representatives of political parties um, in the opposition in the national delegation. So for instance, during the climate negotiations in Sharm el-Sheikh in November, the delegation, they had people from the different ministries, people also representing um, uh, you know, different forms of expertise, but they often also include people from different political parties. So not just 
representing uh, the government as such and the ministries, the bureaucrats, but also those that are sitting in the parliament and um, yeah, implementing or in, in the end implementing also um, the treaties that are negotiated. This is just to show you how complex the spaces are where these um, treaties are negotiated. This is the example of, um, of the climate negotiations that took place in, in, in Bonn. And this is so far interesting because um, the possibilities to shape negotiations and the possibilities to represent ideas is limited to different spaces. So normally you have spaces that only head of states and delegates can access, and then you will have the states where ordinary citizens can go and other non-state actors um, accredited to these meetings. You have badges and the badges uh, indicate your role and give you access to specific meeting rooms and sites. So you, um, the, not all ideas are represented in all settings. It was also noted, especially by scholars from human geography that conferences create new material geographies. So um, conferences often, especially if there are these big mega events, they um, create spaces that are very um, protected and securitized. Um, they might also contribute to urban transformation. So if you imagine um, a city hosting a, this large scale conference, they often produce temporary and permanent changes um, actually in these host cities. So you have conference tourism that is a uh, big business for many cities. They construct sometimes new hotels and create um, all types of uh, recreational activities. Um, it's part of a city's marketing campaign and civic boosterism to host such an event. Um, it can have temporary and longer lasting restrictions also sometimes to go to specific places. And you often have a high degree of surveillance, police and military presence, depending on the city, of course. The picture that you see on the left here, that's the picture from COP21 of the climate negotiations that took place in Paris. It was really difficult to get there. I attended this meeting. Um, and what was also extremely um, difficult was that just a few weeks earlier, you had this uh, very terrible terrorism attack in Le Bataclan. This is why there was also a higher degree of security than normally. But in fact, it's, uh, from my experience, always hard to get to these big uh, mega event sites. Uh, and there is also yeah, a lot of security involved. So um, the conference sites, um, as I mentioned, often have a high degree of um, performance, but not just of performance in theater, as I mentioned, but also performance of legitimacy. So conferences provide a visible stage on which delegates can perform the legitimacy by taking part in these negotiations. So the, atten the attendance is really important also to, ex ex to construct expert identities, whether they are disciplinary, scientific, political, or other. So for instance, um, the ocean negotiations that um, I'm observing together with my team, you attend these conferences and it takes part to your construction as an expert in the site. You will be seen as belonging to the community and as holding a form of, of expertise on what the issues are uh, and how they can be solved. Um, this is a point that I mentioned earlier, the importance of media and big news offering opportunities for individual and host cities to really perform these identities and concerns to a global audience through press conferences, for instance. And um, this implies that you also have media narratives that produce particular visions of the conference, often sensationalizing and commonly reflecting hegemonic political concerns and frequently also excluding alternative understandings, although I would say that this is, uh, has changed in the last years. Um, a very important point also, if we try to challenge this idea of uh, democracy and radical de democracy, especially, and the potential to get alternative visions circulated, how this can be done in online settings. So this really um, important role of protest on the streets. So 
you have different forms of protest and dissent by delegates in the negotiation room, but you also have a lot of activism outside of the conference program, walkouts, demonstrations, we have police brutality, cordons and kettling, sometimes terrorism. Um, so the conference does provide opportunity for high profile protest. And um, there are also very specific ways in which protest is shut down and circumscribed by the host, host city and host government. But what does this now imply uh, for the digital turn? If you just see these pictures, how would such a form of protest be possible if you imagine the multilateral negotiations taking place only online? Is that actually possible? These were some of the questions that uh, we had in mind when we learned that many of the negotiations that we wanted to observe on site were actually moved online, or at least partly. And so this will bring me to the second big part of this lecture. Um, and this is to share with you some of the insights we gained from following negotiations online, but also to situate this a bit in the literature, because um, the digital effects on diplomacy are not new. Um, still, diplomacy is really hard to change. So if you look into literature trying to capture what diplomacy is and how to define it, then um, you will always see scholars saying that, yes, there are new configurations of actors, new information technologies, new political functions that are transforming diplomacy. But uh, this is always happens in ways that prolong established ways of doing things. So change of diplomatic practice um, occurs incrementally. And diplomacy is always seen as something that may transform over time, but only at the margins and evolutionary. And Paul Sharp, who is a, a scholar that has worked intensely on democracy, uh, on diplomacy, sorry, um, has noted that diplomat, diplomats have the tendency to act as defenders and beneficiaries of the present international agreement, which implies resistance to change. And this quote I especially like from Cohen 2013, who said, diplomacy is an old fashioned tradition coexisting with far reaching innovation. Yeah, And one field of this far reaching innovation is the field of um, communication and information technologies that have incrementally changed uh, diplomacy even before COVID-19 forced governments to go online. So there is a certain pressure and need to develop digital diplomatic tools that happened already before, uh, before COVID-19. And that's especially regarding the means of communicating, which are so central to diplomacy. So um, diplomats, including embassies, uh, um, representations of international organizations in different countries, they responded to new technologies um, always. So they employed the telegraph, typewriter, then the telephone. So they always responded to these things and incorporated them to the diplomatic milieu. Um, but over the last decade, we have seen the growth of digital communication technologies, social media, mobile communication devices that posed a real challenge to diplomats. Um, in responding and in terms also of adapting practice as well as organizational capacity. So nevertheless, diplomats and foreign ministries and multilateral negotiations, they somehow seem to have recognized that something significant is occurring here, even if they are not quite sure of its dimension or how they should handle it. That's a quote from Hocking at Al. They wrote a really interesting paper about yeah, how diplomacy response to, to digital um, communication tools. Um, so these are just uh, a few things I would like to share. So a few um, interesting papers showing that diplomatic practice has already intermingled with digital tools and scholars increasingly study the effects of ICTs on, on diplomacy to capture uh, how digital tools affect the principal means by which states communicate with each other, enabling them to have regular and complex relations. So this what I just read, the Parrish and James, um, this is a, a definition of, of diplomacy, which shows how central 
um, communication is. These are just a few terms that emerged since then, trying to capture the effect of ICTs. So you have e-diplomacy, virtual diplomacy, digital diplomacy. I will not go through all of this, but as you can see, these terms, they all appeared uh, after, let's say, yeah, approximately 2005, many of them 2010, 2015. So these were all terms to capture these developments. Um, but what these terms and the related definitions do not capture is the implication um, of digital negotiation tools on multilateralism. So how um, did or does um, the increase of, internet, of, of ICTs, but then also with COVID-19, the emergence of new digital side affect multilateralism? And um, while diplomacy can and does indeed adjust to digitization, especially like bilateral diplomacy and other forms of communication when embassies communicate with citizens and so on, uh, such adaptation is especially difficult in multilateral, in a multilateral context and in a negotiation context. And so the question that I, or that we were asking as a team was, can negotiations go online? Um, and what are the implications, for instance, for all the things that I mentioned earlier? So for the consensus principle, for different forms of protest and dissent, but what, what do these online settings also imply for participation and inclusiveness? So does it affect who participates and how? Does it affect who is included? Um, what kind of power they can exercise? And in the end, will online settings change the outcome of negotiations, change global environmental politics for the good or for the bad. So these were all issues that uh, we didn't know, um, but we somehow had to, yeah, we had to experiment with new methodologies, which we did. Um, and one outcome of this process is a paper that um, I co-authored with my PhD student, Silvia Ruiz Rodriguez. Um, and it's a paper I think that you also have. It's entitled Digital Multilateralism in, in Practice, Extending Critical Policy Ethnography to Digital Negotiation Sites. And what we do in this paper is we try to ask these questions that I just mentioned. Yeah. So to really challenge if the understanding of digital diplomacy that scholars used pre-COVID, if these definitions and this understanding is actually applicable to what we were observing during COVID-19 and what might also be carried into the future um, with new emerging hybrid forms of international negotiations. So what we did is we had two cases um, in the context of BBNJ negotiations. So BBNJ stands for Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction. This is a new treaty that is negotiated since 2018 in the context of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, and I will not talk about what is going on in these negotiations because this will take ages. But what is important is we had um, planned to attend the fourth meeting, the fourth intergovernmental conference where states wanted to finalize a new treaty text to agree on how to protect marine biodiversity in the high seas in the future. And um, two weeks before the negotiations in March 2020, COVID happened and the negotiations were indefinitely postponed. Um, and we were faced with a situation of not knowing what to do. Should we, what, what, how can we continue our research? What can we observe? How can we observe interaction between governments if we cannot travel to a negotiation site and where is communication between governments taking place during COVID-19? Is it taking place? Are governments continuing to talk to each other on this issue, despite the fact that you have a global pandemic um, affecting national economies and societies? There were a lot of issues that we didn't, we're not aware of. And so um, we did two types of things. The first thing we did is um, we developed a survey, an online survey together as a, as a team 
to reach out to state and non-state actors and ask them what they do, how they communicate. And what the second thing we did is we identified two types of digital multilateral sites that emerged to continue treaty discussions in an informal setting. So the first one was the High Seas Treaty Dialogue. They used a video conference tool to communicate, or they use, they still use because they still meet in these settings. And the second one was the BBNJ intersessional work. So they used written chat and video conference as well to be able to continue negotiating the treaty. And we, by conducting digital ethnography and also reflecting on the methods, reflecting on um, the, 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 also the, the validity of this approach, um, we observed the performance of traditional and new diplomatic practices on these sites. Having this question in mind, could these sites actually replace impersonal diplomatic practice? Under which conditions and what effects would this have on policymaking? And just to give you an impression on these two sites, so this was the site number one, the High Seas Treaty Dialogues. Um, so you can see they used WebEx, you can log in, you have um, a, a chair or a group of chairs, including the governments of Monaco, Costa Rica, um, and um, Belgium, and facilitators from the High Seas Alliance and a specific agency of the United Nations. So as I said at the beginning, you need an orchestration. So these sites are also orchestrated by these facilitators. Still, when I logged in for the first time, and this is also important, I asked if I can participate. I was recommended uh, by the Austrian delegate from the Austrian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So I had some kind of legitimacy. This is where I could participate but it was very difficult. So I could not register, for instance, other participants. So this was a very closed room, even though you had all states interested in this treaty present. And um, the very interesting effect uh, or what we observed is that the interaction between states was very similar to the interaction that we observe on, on, on site. There were some differences, but I will point to them later. The second case was the online intercessional work during COVID-19. So this was a process that was led by the president of the negotiations and they used MS Teams. I'm sure some of you know this tool. And they literally posted questions and parts of the treaty asking governments to type in their position. Yeah, And this was a very interesting process to observe because states really engaged in this multilateral and bilateral communication. Um, they could use also um, specific emoticons to like or dislike certain things. So we also um, observed this process. They opened, for instance, a discussion. It was open for seven days and then they closed it again. So they developed really creative practices to be able to maintain this dialogue over a period of two years, actually. So we were asking ourselves, what do we observe there? Is this, does it, is, is this comparable to a multilateral negotiations? Can we clarify this in multilateral negotiations? And one very important response that we had was actually no, because of the very simple fact that these are no, they cannot be formal negotiations. So in fact, everything that took place online was always considered an informal dialogue because there are no rules and procedures under the United Nations that would clarify this a formal negotiation. So the definition that we came up to make sense of what we observed is the definition of multilateral uh, digit, uh, digital multilateralism, which we understand as a set of digital and physical diplomatic practices performed across space and time by state and non-state actors engaged in a joint enterprise of simultaneous negotiation through physical and digital infrastructures in information-rich, highly interactive environments. So our definition includes digital and physical diplomatic practices because what we saw in the digital side were the same actors, the same issues, the same topics, the same 
also the same positions that we also observed in the physical setting. So the digital setting was only possible because a community of practice emerged at the physical side that could easily transgress to the digital side. Um, it's important state and non-state actors. So non-state actors always, always had access to these sites and they could also uh, take the floor and say something. You have this engaged in a joint enterprise, meaning this text, this simultaneous negotiation of text, although, as I said, these cannot be considered as formal negotiations. You have physical and digital infrastructures and the information rich, highly interactive environments, in one case WebEx, in the other case um, you had um, Microsoft Teams. So this is an overview. So as a theoretical framework, you, we use the community of practice approach that allows us to connect the digital and the physical side. We extended critical policy ethnography to digital side. So it's quite interesting because you have a few accounts of digital ethnography or hybrid ethnography that existed already, but not in relation to negotiation settings. So this is why we combined critical ethnography critical policy ethnography with digital ethnography. And we also used insight from the science and technology studies that had already conceptualized um, how digital communication can be studied with digital ethnography. Um, as methods and data, we used collaborative event ethnography, digital ethnography, and we observed 24 of these sessions. And what we could see is that there are on the one side old practices such as diplomatic rituals, the formation of alliances, the sharing of documents, rules and procedures, forms of contestation between the global north and south that are really similar. So there are old practices because they happened as well in the physical negotiation side. But you also have new practices. For instance, that English was the de facto language. So you had no translation at all. Um, non-state actors could take the floor, but only in moments of silence. Yeah. Um, we also saw different digital dip diplomatic practices across sites. So in the high seas treaty dialogues, for instance, you had uh, previously also emotional statements, you had coffee talks, closing words of the president, new practices included facilitators asking for clarification of positions, change hats, so you had, for instance, diplomats saying, uh, I'm talking now for the European Union. And then I said, oh, no, I'm talking as, as a person. So the switching roles, you had informal moments, you had more conversation between governments, which rarely happens uh, in negotiation settings on site. For the BBNJ intercessional work, new practices emerging where emotionless statements, a lack of coffee talks, passive participation of otherwise active state actors. So some actors just didn't show up. Russia, for instance, also China for a very long time did not participate in these meetings because of security concerns. Um, you have also a limited number of speakers per delegation. So normally the delegation sizes varies depending on the capacity of a state, but here it was really limited to one person per issue. And the BBNJ intercessional work on, on WebEx later on, they had um, also a lack of coffee talks, which actually they included later. But you have more and more people that turn their cameras off when delivering um, a statement. So you also have a, a, a change in the digital setting where it becomes less relevant to the actors. However, um, what we can see is that the formal negotiations um, where only one state representative delegation was allowed to be present in the negotiation room. So this is something that happened when they resumed the negotiations in 2022 on site in New York at BBNJ IGC4. You had formal negotiations, but because of security issues, health security issues, only one person per state could be there and no state actors. And everybody else could participate online. So this is what I said at the beginning, these digital practices are carried um, even you know, after COVID-19. And what we had a very exceptional conference here with um, some, uh, yeah, with really a lack 
actually a lack of um, non-state actors participating, um, but the possibility to join online, however, without the possibility to actually make a statement. So in the future, what will be important is to really think carefully about how we can conceptualize hybrid multilateral sites, um, what the behaviors are that um, enable hybrid multilateralism, for instance, or hinder them, how they affect environmental agreement making. So even now in uh, the CBD COP15 that you have, or also in the UNFCCC COP in Sharm El Sheikh, you have online participation possibilities to an extent um, that they are not comparable with what happened before COVID. So you had some sessions recorded, you can watch them online, the plenary sessions, but now you can register as a participant and even follow um, the working group sessions and some informal sessions as well. And this develops really new forms of participation um, that did not exist um, previous to COVID-19. But what did we learn from our survey? So as I mentioned earlier, we conducted a survey in 2020. We had a second round in 2021, where we reached out to negotiators from the BBNJ negotiations, asking them um, how far um, they had used specific communication challenge at the beginning of COVID-19. And what we saw is that there are big differences between state respondents and non-state respondents. So virtual meetings, as you can see here, were used um, much more by um, non-state actors than they were used by state actors. So we interpreted this, that non-state actors um, are much more uh, adaptable to new communication tools which they used, what was not so evident for state actors. This can be interpreted from different angles. So if you uh, remember what I said earlier about the old fashioned, um, the old fashioned style of diplomacy and how it's um, really difficult um, to see change or how diplomacy actually adapts to change. So this may be one interpretation. The other interpretation is that states refrain from using specific tools early on in COVID because of security concerns, because they did not know, or because it was difficult to choose digital tools that states can trust in or can have trust in. So these are possible interpretations. Um, we also asked them to what extent they think that the postponement of the negotiation will affect the overall outcome of the treaty. So here we had, um, many non-state actors saying that it will significantly change the outcome or it will partly change, but actually nobody thought that there will be no effect. So many thought, yes, this will have an effect. From now, from what we know now, it didn't have any effect. The fact that there for two years, they negotiated informally meeting every month for several hours. I would say, I don't know what Paul says because he has followed this too. I would not say that it has substantially changed. And this is something that we underestimated. We thought the fact that governments have more time and use the time to discuss online will make them or will have an effect in so far as states will more likely agree because they understand each other's position. But this is not what happened at all. The conflicts that were there at the beginning are still there. So maybe it needs exactly this kind of drama that I described earlier in the negotiation room, this reaching a stage of almost failing to get the whole thing going. But in fact, this was something that, if I look at these results now, um, this was an impression that government set in 2020, but it's not, uh, it's not what we see today. Um, we asked them if online negotiations make the process more inclusive. And here you also see a big difference between state actors and non-state actors. So state representatives um, tend to say, no, it does not make them more inclusive. And um, non-state actors say yes. So this is a really interesting finding um, that illustrates also, I would say, resistance of state actors to adapt to new technologies. 
but also um, underestimating the value that online participation has for non-state actors and also actors for the global south that cannot travel easily to these sites. Um, we are running out of time, but uh, I think it's, uh, it could be interesting for you to look into our publication because we had a lot of open questions as well that we asked. And the open questions here, we wanted to know um, why can they be more inclusive? Uh, or what are some of the challenges of digital negotiations? And interesting responses were um, related to the time zones, for instance. So simultaneous negotiations online imply that some governments will be in a time zone where it's extremely difficult to follow. I think this is something that we as researchers also experience how difficult it is. For me, for instance, I, I'm registered for the CVD COP15, but um, in fact, if I want to do it, I have to follow from 4 p.m. to midnight and some, sometimes even you know, till 3, 4 in the morning. Um, and this is really difficult. Another issue that was constantly mentioned was the issue of trust. <clears throat> and this was mentioned by many state actors saying, we need the face-to-face -face interaction to build trust. And building trust is key to agree on specific negotiation terms, uh, on, on provisions, on legal text. So this, was, this notion of trust is definitely something that many state actors um, see as the main um, barrier to move negotiations online. So last and not least, I would like to problematize online futures. So firstly, the lack of legitimacy. So um, states during COVID-19, they could not agree on uh, the formal use of online negotiation settings to develop new treaty texts. They could not agree on new wording or make decisions online. So these spaces remained informal and thus had no legitimacy. Um, simultaneous interaction, what I just mentioned, um, it's not inclusive because of the time zones, but also because of connection problems that we often saw, especially from participants uh, from the global south that didn't have a stable internet connection. With MS Teams, we saw the problem that States could participate 24 hours, seven days a week, but there was no simultaneous interaction possible, which we, if you remember, uh, identified as a key characteristic of digital multilateralism. And then the issue of orchestration. So you have a president and chairs and facilitators indeed, and they give the floor to the speakers. However, it's really hard for them also to, let's say, determine the speaking order um, and to manage the whole dynamics of the interaction. So if you have a negotiation room on site, it's much easier to orchestrate um, the meeting than it is in the digital setting. And of course, in the hybrid setting, uh, participants have the role of um, passive observers only. So here it's almost impossible to have meaningful communication uh, and to have somebody orchestrating both online participants and people on site. And this is something that my PhD student Silvia Ruiz Rodriguez is currently exploring in COP15. So the difficulty to actually include people uh, attending online into the hybrid setting of multilateral negotiations. The second problematic point is the lack of space for radical de democracy, as I mentioned earlier. So if we understand radical de de democracy as a space for protest and dissent by civil society, the possibility um, to represent diversity of views and visions on how to protect the environment in the future, then there is, as far as I have experienced and what also our, uh, our respondents to the survey say, there is no room for such protest and dissent that would be meaningful and that could also put pressure on the negotiators. So you might have, for instance, side events online, you might have alternative events, but they do not affect what is happening in the negotiation room. Um, so as a, as a consequence, there is no pressure by the audience. So this pressure is reduced. Um, 
Also some states do not participate at all, at all. So I mentioned Russia earlier, but also China at the beginning that just do not participate in online negotiations and make it very hard to consider these legitimate sites. Um, you have different types of rights, depending on you know, your form of participation on site or online. So on site, um, you can make an intervention also as a non-state actors after all states spoke, if you participate online, um, it's almost impossible. In some negotiations, you cannot even, there is no possibility to put something in a chat or to raise uh, your, your, your arm. It's just not technically not feasible. And um, a last point I would like to make the outsourcing of civil society. That's a danger that could happen that you will have in the future very small negotiations with only a limited percentage of states participating or representing um, there's their governments um, and outsource civil societies who have online events for civil society, but not letting these participants taking part in these settings. I mean, it's not something that we see right now. Um, however, uh, the United Nations, they have a policy to reduce travel, to reduce emissions related to these conferences. So hybrid futures um, are not utopian. They might be the new um, reality of multilateralism, um, which I think this is um, what I wanted to discuss today and what I wanted to also um, show you today, that uh, we need to more carefully think about the implications of digital multilateralism and new hybrid forms of negotiating environmental futures. So having said that, thank you very much for your attention um, and stay healthy.